Hello from Converge. Welcome to our session today. I'm Farina and I lead the International Emerging Tech Team at Walmart based in the US. We are so lucky to have such an esteemed panel of innovators with backgrounds in entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, and academia. Today's discussion will be focused on fostering entrepreneurship through cross collaboration between industry, academia, and the startup ecosystem. From the stories of our panelists today, we will aim to answer the question, can entrepreneurship be taught? Without further ado, I would like to turn it over to our panelists to introduce themselves and share a little bit more about their professional backgrounds. Varun, you're top of my screen. Let's start with you. Hi guys, my name is Varun. I've been an entrepreneur for the last 13 years. I started one of India's first e-commerce companies, it was called Alma Mater, way back in 2009. I've been a strong evangelist of entrepreneurship in India, and I've spoken at around six to 700 colleges across India promoting entrepreneurship in the last 10 years. I even wrote a book about entrepreneurship in 2012, uh, which was read by about half a million people and inspired many young Indians to pursue entrepreneurship. Uh, right now, I'm working on an edtech startup called Mento, where we teach alternative careers such as filmmaking, screenwriting, so on and so forth, uh, using celebrities and experts. Uh, I don't have a lot of fun facts about me, but I do have 13 cats, and I think that's pretty cool. So that's all about me. 13 cats, one for every year you've been an entrepreneur. Wonderful. Yes. Let's move on to Ganesh. Thank you, Farina. Um, hi, I am the Chief Operating Officer at NSR Cell. Uh, NSR Cell is the startup hub and entrepreneurship center at IM Bangalore. My own background is a mix of corporate and entrepreneurship. Um, on the corporate side, uh, worked with organizations like PepsiCo, HP, Manthan, Bridge I2I. Uh, I've attempted a couple of startups um, in the artisan community retail spaces. Uh, otherwise, my best background is in product management and product marketing. Extremely thrilled to be here. And a fun fact for Farina. Um, in earlier lives, when I've traveled, I've, uh, I've collected coasters from all the pubs that I've been to. And some of them say very interesting stories. Well, I would have loved to see your background with all of your coasters set up, but maybe another time. Uh, let's move on to Satya. Hi, everybody. Really delighted to be here at the Walmart Converge. Uh, my name is Satya. Uh, I have a mixed background, just like Ganesh. Uh, the first 20 years of my life, I spent at Intel, um, working on all different types of products and engineering, marketing, strategy, and planning. Uh, and then I did a startup outside of Intel. And then finally, now I think I found my calling. Uh, I am associated with an academia in terms of teaching innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, a fun fact about me is I love trains or railroads and pretty much anywhere I've gone, I've tried to sneak a ride, whether it's a long distance or just a short distance. So that's a fun fact about me. I wonder if Bollywood had any influence over this love of trains. There are always uh, trains in Bollywood movies. I love it. Bhavna, over to you. Perfect. Um, well, by education, I'm a mechanical engineer. So I think I've always had a knack for uh, the uncommon part. Um, but yeah, I think my only corporate gig ever was right out of college while I was, I was recruited to go join one of India's leading automobile companies as their first woman engineer on ground. And it was fun, had a blast doing it for two years, but very quickly realized corporate wasn't for me at all. Uh, post which I kind of went on to um, launching three ventures. So I'm on venture number three. Uh, not really focused on a particular sector. And I, I call myself an accidental entrepreneur. Every time I can do it, I tell myself it's the last time. And invariably in a couple of weeks, I find myself into the next thing. And that's been life for the last eight years. Um, a fun fact about me is, I mean, I'm, I'm going to link it back to entrepreneurship. I think every time I've decided to kind of go launch a venture, I've done it underwater. So I always dive. I know a lot of people go blank underwater and it's meditative. For me, I feel like everything scary hits me underwater and then I kind of come out and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it. And yeah, that's, that's a little fun fact about me. That's wonderful. I can completely relate to that. Mm -hmm. I love being underwater because no one can reach you. My phone is not pinging. Yeah. I'm not on Zoom calls. It's beautiful. Yeah. Well, um, let's jump right into the meat of the discussion. I'm sure each one of you has a lot to share on this topic, but let's start with you, Ganesh. 
with your journey with NSR Cell, you've played a pivotal role in supporting the startup ecosystem. So tell us a little bit more about NSR Cell and the startup ecosystem in India, how that's evolved and your role um, in helping that transition. Sure. Um, interestingly, when NSR Cell started about 18, 20 years ago, uh, and sometimes we say that even in public domain, we were the only gig in town. The idea of an incubator, the idea of an accelerator was, was a little alien. There were entrepreneurs who somehow figured it on their own through their own mechanisms, changes in policy, their access to networks. And, and in early days, uh, NSR Cell and my predecessors and, and the faculty here had to almost sell the concept and find the entrepreneur and get him into an incubator and, and then help foster uh, the, the entrepreneur on their journey. I think over the la if I look at the last maybe eight, 10 years, and maybe over the next la last couple of years and where we are today, maybe I see two distinct clusters and, and that reflects uh, NSR's own journey. Um, maybe until a couple of years ago, um, there's a big uh, sort of movement within Indian entrepreneurship system of, of tech enabled ventures. So a, a deep set of innovation in business models, operating models by injecting any form of technology or, or tech enabled structuring into the ventures construct. And, and that was a great wave that, uh, that has continued even till today. And probably two or three things have happened there. Because of that, India as a market for entrepreneurs has taken off. I mean, even for entrepreneurs within India, the awakening of the Indian consumer as a viable, large, scalable market has really emerged. And, and that continues to, till day to day and, and hopefully for the next many years. And that's an interesting phase in our entrepreneurial evolution. The second is a, is a pivotal flip, uh, almost an India for the world kind of movement for entrepreneurs and especially tech enabled ventures. But from India targeting global markets, especially in the enterprise space, but probably not necessarily restricting that, has really taken off some, some very, very exciting ventures out of India, which have looked at global markets and, and done phenomenally well and, and inspired us on their journey. The third is a funny one. Um, a lot of global entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial ventures have, start, have been looking at India as a source of innovation. And probably Walmart and yourselves are, are an interesting example of that. Uh, not just for talent, but as sort of a, a great pool where complex innovation can, can be germinated and then exploded out into the market. And that entire perspective of our ability to think about businesses, processes, creative uh, articulation with a global mindset is a fascinating evolution that we've, we've gone through. If I see what's happening from that sort of platform over the last Maybe maybe a year and a half or so. I think three things are coming together and are probably in some kind of a cusp. Uh, one is that the culture of entrepreneurship in the country is changing. And I say that changing in sort of a continuous tense, which is it's an acceptable career. Um, and it's, a, it's an acceptable career in a sustaining manner, not something that one would flirt with, but one would imagine that once I venture out of college and once I've got maybe a little bit of experience under my belt, if I so choose to, I can do this for the next 20, 30 years. And we've got over the past, even if I look at the last maybe 12, 18 months itself, successful ventures with 21 year olds who have been role models, successful ventures with 65, 70 year old entrepreneurs. I'm not saying ageism in a good or a bad manner, but in an exp extremely inspiring manner that says that this is a sustaining career choice for many of us today in the country. And that's an exciting place to be. The second is the ecosystem has dramatically evolved over the last 12, 18, 24 months. The funding ecosystem, the network ecosystem, the sheer knowledge capital that an entrepreneur has access to today uh, to smoothen his venture journey, which is in any case cathartic, but access to knowledge and networks makes that journey far more interesting and probably less frictionful, if I may, for the entrepreneur. The third is the government lens, and, and that has surprised and fascinated me. Um, the government, both at the center and at the state, and their attention to entrepreneurship, their willing to invest into the ecosystem, their willingness to support either industry networks or, or their own platforms for entrepreneurship is a fascinating movement. And, and for an emerging market like ours, for the government themselves to, to put such a sharp focus on entrepreneurship is very fascinating. 
from our own perspective as an academic business incubator i think all of this is an early stage work in progress i i think we're at a fascinating cusp of entrepreneurial journey within the country itself and that's sort of my slightly winded take on where i see our own journey as an entrepreneurial nation yeah you've given us a, a lot of content to sort of chat about um, let's get the perspective of one of the entrepreneurs bhavna I don't know if I have a perspective about the country as a whole, but I think I have a deep perspective about entrepreneurship. Right? I think a ton of us—it's like the grass is always greener on the other side, right? I think entrepreneurship is one of those things that is deeply romanticized, uh, right? And I think it's become aspirational in some forms, at least for a little skew. And I think that's that's a movement in the right direction, right? But I think it's always a little bit of. awakening on there are so many aspects to take into account right i mean it's it's not just a financial ecosystem that's getting evolved there is an entire emotional mental ecosystem that has to get evolved it has to come down to is our country okay with celebrating failure because entrepreneurship comes with deep deep failure right and i i think why we're taking strides ahead um i think there's a large part i mean there's a long way yet to go right i do think um just how we are as a society you know there's a lot of competition in built in all of us right whether it is the way you're educated the way you get your first job and even with entrepreneurship right with all of this celebration around it i do my take on entrepreneurship is i wish as a country and as a society we start celebrating failures a little bit more and i think that gets is great to kind of get into that space right so i wouldn't talk about the progress we've made but i wish in the next four or five years we can really really start making heroes uh of people who've tried absolutely and burn you've been an entrepreneur now for a long time what's your perspective on these like changing dynamics of the social fabric and how it impacts entrepreneurship i think it's changed a lot from the last uh, in the last 10 years or so so when i started uh, when i started off as an entrepreneur it was almost considered to be a taboo to be an entrepreneur right because there was hardly any uh there was hardly any ecosystem around it and there was hardly any information about it I remember I wrote a book called How I Braved Anu Aunty, where Anu Aunty is that member of the society who's always telling you you can't do this, right? Um, and that's how 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 much entrepreneurship was considered as a as as something that you you shouldn't even look at as a career option. So in the last ten years, I think we've come a really really long way in terms of our country, uh, you know, producing so many new entrepreneurs and so many new startups and so on. But I think uh, the fundamental aspect, I think also like uh, Bhavna said. is the fundamental aspect to entrepreneurship is overcoming the fear of failure is overcoming the uncertainties and you know having the mental strength to deal with entrepreneurship and i think that is something uh, that should be celebrated more or romanticized more uh, right now what we're seeing is a social proof aspect because xyz is raising so much money and xyz built this company so i'm going to do that as well but nobody sees what happens behind the scenes and i think if you go and ask any entrepreneur they'll tell you that entrepreneurship is one of the toughest things in the world um uh, that being one and the second being uh, i think what is happening is because 90% of india earns less than 10000 rupees a month entrepreneurship is still restricted um uh, i would say to the semi privileged and the privileged where you know you have a backing of your family or you know that if you don't earn for 2 3 years you'll be taken care of but this 90% which is the 1.1 billion that we're sitting on i think there's immense talent uh, there and if we can figure out either through the government or uh, you know through what the nation team are doing where we can give them an opportunity uh, to come out with ideas and become entrepreneurs then we're going to see something very phenomenal come out of india and also i think uh, while ganesh spoke about tech entrepreneurship i think the real need for the next 10 years is for us to push smes uh, because smes are the building blocks of any economy and if the entrepreneurship wave can ride uh, and build more smes in india and get a lot of young uh, uh, youngsters to you know start small and medium enterprises that can really contribute to the economy i think that will have an even more impact than just uh, tech enabled uh, startups yeah that's great you've kind of highlighted some of the current challenges that need to be overcome I- i'd love to hear from the panel if there are some other challenges that you see that need to be overcome and maybe some uh, thoughts on how the community is overcoming them or what needs to be done to overcome them i want to go uh, freena in this Please. one um i think we want to set the context for what entrepreneurship is and what entrepreneurship is not right mm-hmm. and uh, just you know and 
some of us are engineers and some of us are not. But I think a common definition, I think, is a good thing. And I want to highlight, and this, not just from the point of view of definition, but I want to state the definition so that we can have a good debate on this one, right? Uh, the best form of, on, the best definition I've come across um, is an easy one. And it simply says, you know, it's acting on opportunities and ideas and transforming it into value for others. And the value could be financial, could be cultural, could be social, right? So most often than not, when we talk about entrepreneurship, it's equated to startups. And I like to kind of put it out there and you know, invite my fellow panelists to debate. Uh, that is not necessarily the case. Uh, I think Varun made a very passionate thing about SMEs. I mean, they are the backbone of any economy, growing, growth, developing, no matter how you look at it. Uh, but I'd like to go further and say SMEs are important. But I think, you know, look what's happening in some of the global capability centers or GCCs in, in India. And there are more than a thousand. Uh, and entrepreneurship within the confines of a corporate thing, uh, you know, is less celebrated and it's also called entrepreneurship. So I think entrepreneurship is fairly broad. I think, and we have to celebrate it in all the different forms, uh, whether it is um, in uh, corporate, uh, whether it is in a startup, whether it's in SMEs or a plain, you know, vanilla entrepreneurship, the mom and pop uh, store. So I think that's something that I think we shouldn't forget because today with all the in the financial things, you know, we're all caught up in that hype and, you know, entrepreneurship equal to startups need not necessarily be the case. I think it's a much broader thing and, you know, expanding the entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, one of the things uh, in, I failed to say this in my uh, introduction, uh, I am the founding uh, director for the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at a university. And one of the things that we're trying to change is, uh, the first thing we tell them is, we're not here to make you entrepreneurs. What we really want you to leave this place is the entrepreneurial mindset. And, you know, you can carry your entrepreneurial mindset to your higher studies, to a corporate job, uh, to a, you know, family enterprise or, a, you know, a regular quote unquote startup, right? So just wanted to make sure that we broaden the definition so that we can have a much more richer, uh, you know, conversation. Absolutely. And thank you for pointing out the, the entrepreneurship aspect to that. I'd love to dig a little bit deeper into that. Um, how are you seeing, or in your experience at Intel, how have you seen entrepreneurship really play an important role in building that entrepreneurial mindset? Yeah, uh, it's an absolute great one. So in India, I think we've come, what, about roughly 20 years. I moved back in 2002 to be part of the uh, organization to set up the server development process, right? And that was when there was no data center. So when we came to set up shop here, we had to first build our own data center before we could design any chip. And 20 years into this journey, and I'm sure not just in Intel, but just about any of the thousand GCCs that are there, we've come quite a long way. And one of the aspirational things, um, you know, of any team, you know, talk to your favorite team, uh, it could be, you know, somebody in Walmart, it's, hey, I'm doing a lot of great stuff. I mean, there's the cost, the productivity and all of that. But you know what, at the end of the day, we and the team would love to, you know, put a product uh, on a roadmap from here, right? Uh, everything from conception to design to development to taking it to market and be, you know, and own it, right? Have the accountability, not just for the PNL, but to make sure that. So I've seen that over the last 20 years, um, most of the MNCs and, you know, the India companies and, uh, Ganesh eloquently talked about it, right? We may be here in India, but we're serving a global market. There is an, a, a hunger for, you know, breaking the mold, looking at things differently and uh, creating value, uh, which is significantly more than what has been assigned to us, right? So I see that as a, one of the biggest differences. And we were lucky to create actually a, a blockbuster product um, and I won't put a plug for it, but uh, it, it's taken us about 15 years to get to the point where we can actually do it uh, from grounds up here in India. That's great. Um, I see you navigated away from the plug, but you know what? I'm going to take a moment and uh, make a plug for our team, the Walmart Global Tech Team in India. I will say a lot of the products that get launched all across the world, not just in the US, are built in India and the quality is just phenomenal. So, you know, I, I do want to give a shout out to my colleagues in Global Tech that have been just absolutely great to work with and are doing some great work. All right, I'm done with my plug. So let's focus back on this panel. Thank you, Satya, for sharing some of the, the additional challenges and uh, what's available in the ecosystem to overcome that. Any other perspectives from our panelists on some challenges and how we might overcome them? 
so there's one dimension to so the combination of entrepreneurship entrepreneurship that we are experiencing now uh, a, a lot of corporates uh, come to us and, and want to participate in what we are trying to do within uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem here with the perspective of trying to in one part fold in innovations that might be outside of their firewalls as it were and and sometimes many of the leaders of innovation that i speak to in larger corporates all also want to bring in that risk taking entrepreneurial culture into their organization saying if somehow we can create sandboxes or platforms for entrepreneurs to work off of our backbone in some way we are learning from them we are learning from them how to imagine how to design redesign how to reinterpret a process or a problem and for us who are a global or a fortune 50 or a fortune 500 this cultural infusion is as important as the innovation piece itself and we are finding a lot of conversations around those and we want to work with you because of outside of everything that we might learn we want to get a cultural infusion and that's a fascinating thing just the opening up of the mind is a fascinating thing to see absolutely and um i'm going to change the topic just slightly bhavna i'm going to put you on the spot i'm sure you get asked this all the time but what has your journey as the successful female entrepreneur been in this you know changing ecosystem never been asked that question before <laughs> but um, you know i think a lot has changed right and we have to acknowledge it um but i'm going to answer that question in two prongs i think um I'm specific to India, right? I think being a woman founder, first as founder, I think entrepreneurship is hard. Uh, I think the second one are the fundamental pieces, right? It comes down to capital, people, and operations. Any any journey is basically kind of broken down into these three. Um, I think operations is a question, right? It, it, you have to kind of come down to. I'm not even just going to talk about funding because I think that's what most people kind of go down. I think that's mm-hmm. important, and enough has been said about that. but i think with operations as well right i think when you're trying to put together a fantastic team which is important to build any any vision that you have it comes down to the talent available in the market right it comes comes down into who is your team are you able to build a team of people who think like you who operate like you um you know i think those and those cultural differences are huge right and i think that's it's changed a fair amount right i think if you look at the last decade i think there are a lot more women entrepreneurs now with a good mix of team members right i think it comes down to that and operation that but i think that's a fantastic change to see right um i think gender and age is an issue as well right when you kind of break it down to if you're a 25 year old female entrepreneur and suddenly you're hiring and recruiting people and there are these but generally men there is a dynamic issue there right and i think there's a lot of overcoming that from an operational lens but i think women are doing really well in india and you know you, you watch the young ones come forward and they're vocal they they're not apologetic and i think that's 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 been a refreshing change and i see that in myself i mean the first 20 the way i operated at 24 and the way i operate now is dramatically different and i think that's it's really important here to challenge status quo and i think funding and financing and the investor world you see a dramatic change there as well right i think a decade ago there wouldn't be a female associate on the team and things that has changed a fair amount there are analysts and associates who are women very few partners still and i think that's going to take a while but that's that's an important change that has to come across right because that's where a lot of the decisions are made so yeah i think that's that's how i look that's how i look at the ecosystem changing for a woman today can, can i ask, ask a question of bhavna please uh, sure. uh, and this is uh, from our we've been trying to we've been playing in the area of women entrepreneurship from an i am bangalore and as also perspective for about 5 6 years now Uh, and we're trying very hard to bring in the gender lens to smooth, smoothen the entrepreneur's journey across the sort of three pillars that that you that you articulated yeah. nicely one of the things we we still grappling with and like to believe our thinking as well as work in progress is helping a woman entrepreneur sustain the journey uh, and i don't know if it's uh, an india thing a cultural thing or just because the ecosystem like you said even funding ecosystem with enough women partners out there is still maturing right and so there are other cultural battles that one has to fight as yeah. an entrepreneur we find the sort of survival rate uh, of women entrepreneurs a little lesser than the rest of our cohorts and that's something we're trying very very hard to grapple with and and solve for your experience sure. your I mean, advice you have an 
I have an answer and a theory for this. And uh, it's something that I think I've taught myself and I've challenged a fair amount is I think as a society, we're very protective of our women, right? And uh, for the right and wrong reasons, right? I think it's the way we brought up is, hey, you know, if it's my son, you know, he'll fight it out, it'll be fine. But if it's my daughter, you know, I'm going to protect her from every ill that comes by. And I think this is not with regard to entrepreneurship. I think it's with regard to a lot of stuff, right? And entrepreneurship is not easy, right? I mean, it's it's a cycle you go through. I'm on my high and you definitely have to go through your lows. And I think when the low hits, a lot of the family, a lot of the friends come in and say, you know, don't worry, just quit, it's okay. And I think that's a huge difference, right? I think you need to build a support system to sustain the lows and say, it'll pass, kind of keep at it. And I, that's, my, that's my theory. Any other thoughts on this topic of female entrepreneurship, some of the challenges that you've noticed before we move on? You know, I'd like to just bring in uh, the very, very early stage uh, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs, you know, bubbling in the university. Um, so we have data from the last three years. And, uh, you know, I'm super thrilled to, you know, share with you that, uh, and we've tracked the number of, you know, the gender uh, representation in the class. Um, we have data starting from 2018 Jan. And, you know, it's been almost 50-50. Right. And, and that is actually much better than the actual intake of any college. Um, so there's something that I think excites and, uh, you know, there's something about it that draws, you know, across the gender. And uh, maybe like as Bhavna said, um, there are some cultural stuff. And, I, and for this, I don't have the data, but we do notice it, right? Which is, you know, they are far more expressive, far more, you know, uh, creative. But when it comes to presenting stuff in front of others and, claiming, you know, sort of the ownership for presenting a brand new idea or, you know, a, you know, very um, off-field, uh, you know, uh, idea, uh, there's a reluctance. There is, there is something holding them back. And I think, uh, Ganesh, I don't know if uh, there are certain things that you have done yeah. in this area to understand where that is coming from. Like, you know, it could be cultural, it could be social, it could be, maybe it's just new. Yeah. It also comes down to we're not very good at negotiating. You know, we're very bad at asking for things. And it's, it's I mean, there are, there are enough studies done, not just for entrepreneurs, right? But even in the corporate world, women find it very hard to negotiate the salaries and ask for a raise and ask for, you know, I don't know if that's how we're built or it's deep, deep, deep social conditioning from generations. But I think it's the same that kind of replicates with entrepreneurship, right? It's, hey, I need to do this. I'm not going to get, not go too high. I'm not going to be too loud and I'm not going to be too... So I think it's all things that will break with time. Uh, I think as you get a little less apologetic about many things, you start overcoming all of this. But I also, I mean, this is just experience through the pandemic months. Uh, and, and one of, as with many entrepreneurial businesses, many of the ventures, the cohorts that we're working with went through their ups and downs because of lockdowns and, 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 and pandemic related sort of constraints. And, and we did a series on business continuity with a lot of our founding entrepreneurs saying, now, therefore, how do you conserve cash? How do you manage customers? How do you retain employees? Or if you need to uh, downsize and things of that kind. I wish I could do this statistically, but disproportionate amount of women entrepreneurs were reluctant to downsize. They were far more empathetic towards what are the few things I can do while retaining my team? Uh, and Varun with, and Satya, for you and me and others, uh, uh, in, a male entrepreneur would be far more, let me say a little clinical about this. The venture comes at the heart of things. And if I need to protect cash flows, there are a few unfortunate hard decisions I need to make. And I'll try to make them as respectfully as I can. For the woman entrepreneur, the pivot was fascinating. I mean, we would consistently get requests to our mentor panel saying, I don't want to downsize. How can you help me? Um, and and that's just a very different sort of empathetic lens to entrepreneurship. I'm actually really surprised by that. Uh, I, I, I understand where it's coming from. I would, I would kind of dig a little deeper and say, what are the outcomes? Right? I think there are different processes. I, I'm not saying I understand this, but gut feel would be, if it was me, which I have, right? I've evaluated what my options are. And I think... I mean, this even kind of played out at women leaders around the world from a political lens, right? They were the ones who took the harder, hardest yeah. steps to kind of curb COVID, right? 
So I think for me, if I had taken that one step forward, I would say they would have evaluated it. But at the end of the day, they would have not shied away from doing the hard thing for the business. Is my gut, but I'd love fascinating, to know that. fascinating perspective. I just, I just yeah. want to add one thing here. Um, so basically, there's an unfortunate statistic that only seven percent of urban Indian women actually work. Only seven percent. In fact, we're, we're one of the lowest in the world, lesser than even Bangladesh and Pakistan. So I was talking to a female uh, founder friend of mine who is running a company that focuses on financial products for women, and she said, "the the higher you go in status, the the more restricted you get to work." So the, they found that women in rural areas work more than women in urban areas because the moment you reach a certain status, then it's not considered uh, culturally right for the for the woman to work. And I think if we don't we don't get this balance right, no matter how many startups we start, no matter what we do, we'll never be a great economy. Because unless the male and the female population of the of the country work equally, we're never going to be a great economy. I mean, China and US are hitting forty percent, and we're at seven percent. So uh, I would say that the solution to this is to celebrate as many women entrepreneurs as we can, and to celebrate as many success stories of women entrepreneurs as we can. uh the way the the ecosystem in india grew in the last 10 years was through all of this right was talking about the ecosystem constantly celebrating young entrepreneurs and all of that and i think if we start doing that with a lot of women entrepreneurs there could be a cultural shift because 10 years ago it was not cool to start be an entrepreneur now it is so maybe in 5 years we could probably put an end to some of this cultural stigma and varun on that note uh, i'm again happy to share uh, we'll not put the plug for yet another corporate but one of the large software global giants which is in india they started a program uh, called women in science and engineering or yes. wise and that's just focused on um, you know aspiring entrepreneurs or engineers in engineering college and it's been a fascinating program because i think uh, at the heart of the program is to provide them with mentors who have actually gone through the path and bunch of other things which i don't necessarily understand and we don't have data but the fact that there is somebody and this is the fifth year in a row that they are doing uh, second year in uh, bangalore and five years out of hyderabad and uh, you know it's it's great because they, you know somebody said hey we've got to make this a mission right like as you said varun that uh, unless we do something about it it's not going to change in 10 years or 15 years so there are pockets of these things that are starting to happen and i hope that you know it just you know goes beyond the one one season the two season and that we see this concerted effort to say hey there there is something about women entrepreneurs and they're great at this um here's some way we things we can help and hopefully you know that will help us bring to the state that you're talking about since this topic's really close to me i'll say one last thing and i know we'll not talk about it anymore varun to your point you know I, that statistic was heard and uh, it goes back to the same thing that i said right not women entrepreneurs but women working in general it is hard right from a construct even whether it's corporate whether it's it's anything right i mean as we age when many women fall off when they get married because you know that's when they're like hey you know there's a there's a working member in the family and again it comes from concern i think there could be a social construct to it but it comes from why do you have to why do you have to trouble yourself right and i think we keep saying that a lot to the women in this country saying you know you don't need to it's not that she wants to but it's there is no need and you know whether you have to travel to go to office you know bus that is crowded with men whatever it is right there's a lot of that and that discomfort to get to work and when you have your support system telling you you don't have to whether that's when you get married when you have a kid when you have a come back from maternity leave i think from a construct perspective all of that needs to be rejected a fair amount to kind of sustain people in the system i think that's where a lot of us are going right now yeah i agree and we need we need that to change for sure and well if we don't well none of this that we discussed will help our economy because we need to definitely have more women working that's probably the first solution to make india like an economy that is at a world level i like where we concluded on that we need more women this is a call to action so all the women out there in the audience you know keep persisting and don't give up on your hopes and dreams so um with that um i want to dig a little bit deeper into kind of you know both bhavna and varun you've been serial entrepreneurs but if you can think back to you know being a first time entrepreneur um what are some of the 
the dilemmas that you had? What were the thoughts going on through your mind? Any challenges and kind of how you overcame that and became successful? Um, well, I would say uh, the, the thing that I learned about entrepreneurship most uh, is that any other skill can be learned. Like you can learn whatever skill that is, that is needed to become an entrepreneur. In fact, if you put enough hours, you can probably learn that in a few months, right? So any sort of skills that is needed uh, to become an entrepreneur can be learned. But the thing that can't be learned is the mental aspect of it, right? Uh, mm-hmm. the, the ups and downs that entrepreneurship puts you, the kind of anxiety, uncertainty, uh, you know, the highs and lows. Um, I think I was probably diagnosed with every mental health condition there could be uh, uh, while running my startup without even realizing it. And I think that's, that's where we really go along. And the second thing is the stigma with mental health that exists in this country. Mm-hmm. So those are two very dangerous factors running together. On, with entrepreneurship, you are bound to be, you know, working at an extremely high uh, mental condition. And which is why uh, having regular therapy or having like a regular mental coach, uh, for me, is teaching entrepreneurship. So for me, I don't think you need to go to entrepreneurship school or you need to learn entrepreneurship because every skill can be literally learned on the job. But I think what is more needed is mental health coaches or probably a therapist, because I think that is probably something that I did not anticipate. Uh, I did not anticipate how I'd feel when I'd lose a deal. I did not anticipate how I'd feel when somebody doesn't respond to my mail. I did not know how I'd feel when I don't have salary to pay at the end of the month. I did not have, I did not know how I'd feel when I would have to tell some of my employees I can't pay them this month. Just... I think all of those things, right, when they add up eventually over the years, that's when it starts hitting you. I think the mental health aspect of entrepreneurship is not only the most underlooked, I think it should be something that should be taught. It should be something that should be, uh, uh, you know, uh, mandatory. Like you should have a mandatory investor should, should have a therapist to, to, to monitor the entrepreneur and so on and so forth. Um, and I think if mentally you're strong enough, then you can literally overcome anything. Right. Because every day is a fight. Every day something is breaking. That's all you're doing. But if mentally you start breaking down. Right. And then you start losing, losing the, the, the desire. Uh, that's when uh, that's when I think things fall apart. So I don't think that most startups fail because of the startup. Most startups fail because of the entrepreneur. Right. Either the entrepreneur runs out of steam or either the entrepreneur is fed up. I always I always uh, equate entrepreneurship to a very toxic relationship. Right. In a toxic relationship, you're in love once and you're in hate once. So, you're, you know, you're like, oh, now I'm breaking up. But then tomorrow, like, no, I have to get back with you again. Right. So I think <laughs> entrepreneurship is like an analogy. Yeah. So <laughs> think, uh, entrepreneurship is like being in a super toxic relationship. Now, if you go to a therapist and you tell the therapist that I'm in a toxic relationship, the first thing the therapist is going to say, leave the relationship and work on yourself. Right. But when it comes to your startup, how do you do that? Right. Because you need to go back to that. And at the end of the day, you're like, I'll never start up again. You know, like Bhavna said, uh, you know, I'll never ever start my company again. And again, you're back starting up again, right? So I think, I think, I don't know if you're doing this, Ganesh, uh, but I think the most important aspect yeah. for entrepreneurship <clears throat> is mental health. Yeah. And if you can take care of them mentally, I think the skills you can even learn on YouTube these days, right? So I, I really don't think uh, the skills are more of an aspect, but the mental health is something that can't be just taught easily. I'll, I'll agree in part and disagree in part. The mental health, you're absolutely right. Um, we try a little bit. Uh, I don't think we try enough. Uh, I, I don't know what enough might mean. Uh, but the idea of mental and emotional resilience through an entrepreneurial journey. And again, the pandemic months, and I, just having observed so many of my entrepreneurs pass through our system, um, it's been a very, very tough journey for many of the entrepreneurs, which means they have no control of things which are happening within the business. At least sometimes you can you can blame a goat, or you can fire someone, or you can scream at a customer or a supplier. During the pandemic months, you don't you don't even have a punching bag to hit. And and I, and we found that many of our cohorts and entrepreneurs were grappling with that absolute uncertainty. I, I can't control what's happening out here. And, and we tried a little bit with what you're saying with building mental strength and resilience. I wonder if there's anything called enough there. The small place where I'll disagree, uh, and this is a plug for my faculty colleagues and I have immense respect for them. You can't learn it off YouTube. Bro. Uh, you got to meet my I mean, faculty on, on colleagues. The job. On the job, <laughs> on the job, but not maybe not YouTube, but on the job. Sure. Ah. 
Uh, Thanks for uh, setting it up, Ganesh. And I have to say this, uh, Varun, um, you know, I, I agree with you. Uh, I'll agree and disagree with parts. The agree part of it, the mindset. And we have something, we, you know, we kind of made it up. 60, 30, 10 rule, right? So when we set out to create a, a curriculum for entrepreneurship, I mean, the first question was, I think, what Farina started off with. Can he even teach entrepreneurship? So there's been about 15 years of research that's gone in, right? Real hardcore research backed by data that most aspects of it, right? Most aspects of it can be taught. Um, and there are, you know, really famous folks like uh, Dr. Sarah Saraswati who's led this thing. And there are lots of theories. But coming to the point, the 60-30-10, the 60% we focus on in the entrepreneurship education at CIE is really around mindset. Right? 30% is business acumen. 10% is tech because, I mean, we're shoving enough tech into these guys' heads. I mean, that can be learned on YouTube. But, you know, the mindset part, I think you need to be in a psychologically safe yeah. environment where you yeah. can fail, where you can be stupid uh, or quote unquote stupid. You could come up with crazy zany ideas, which, you know, border on insanity and still be okay to, you know, carry off, right? The grades don't count anything with respect to the ideation capabilities. Can, can you think of something that's extraordinary? Can you be imaginative? Can you be creative? Da, da, da. So the 60% of our effort actually goes into the mindset. And part of it is really around the resiliency. And if you look at any number of Harvard Business Review articles or the psychological journals, resiliency can be learned. Um, some of it is innate. Some people are just resilient by nature. I mean, yeah. you hit them with anything and they'll just spring back. But, you know, most of us, I think, you know, we take a deep beating. It takes, you know, either a coach or a therapist or a good family friend or, you know, some kind of support to put us back on track. And if you can create the notion that entrepreneurship is a, a collaborative journey, there are people in the ecosystem, your own buddies, your teammates, your founders, your board, that, hey, there is a system out there that can put you back on track uh, should the worst thing happen. Knowing that is, I think, at least the start of uh, a thing, right? So I live in the Bay Area and I never had the courage to you know, join a startup when I saw people left, right, and center. But 20 years later, right, um, you know, by your standards, I'm pretty much old, uh, right? My first entrepreneurial journey was 42. But there was something that I went through in my life, uh, the personal thing that made, you know, was very difficult, but, you know, helped me to build resiliency. And somewhere out of the blue, I said, hey, it's okay to quit a perfectly cushy job with lots of, you know, salaries, ESOPs and other things, and then go off and do something goofy, right? So I think it can be learned from my own personal experience. And two, entrepreneurship education, as you rightly pointed out, should really focus on the mindset and leave some of the rest to, you know, let them learn on the job. Or as you very casually put it, hey, go learn it on YouTube. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something that we do that I've been doing on my workshop for teacher resilience. So we, we call it the poker therapy. Uh, so basically, uh, we, nice. we convince all our aspiring entrepreneurs to learn poker and, and play poker regularly because with poker, you can't get attached to the hand. Um, and no matter what you do, right, uh, you, you cannot change your emotions, right? So when you've dealt with the bad hand, bad hand, how to maintain your calm, whether you dealt with the good hand, how to maintain your calm and how not to get attached to your hand. And even if you lose all your money, it's not in your hands, right? So that's really been helping. I think a lot of, a lot of young entrepreneurs are learning how to let go of control by using poker as a means of therapy, because control becomes the most important mechanism when you're, especially when you're the founder, right? It's very difficult to let go of control. And um, I think poker is really helping them understand that you really can't control everything. And that's really, that's one of the things that we've tried and, and it is showing some improvements, but then again, like, you know, I guess it's very subjective and for each person it's own. But I really like the fact that you agree with me that, that the tech aspect of it can be taught over YouTube or on, on the job. I know Ganesh will disagree and I know Ganesh won't be happy with this. Uh, but uh, sincerely Ganesh, I really feel that uh, it should be more about the mindset. It should be more about uh, because when you're an entrepreneur, that's when it hits you. Trust me, when you don't have salary to pay at the end of the month, none of the teachings that you would have given about, about structure or process or all of that goes out of the window. Yeah. Right. So how do you still you know, stay? But I think Varun, you're overlooking a fact that, I mean, knowing that something is possible, right. That yeah. I could bounce back. There is help to be sought. Uh, going to a therapist may not yeah. be such a bad thing. And we've had some, you know, uh, like mental health folks come in 
and talk to people, uh, you know, at least once a semester saying that it's okay. And it's not just for entrepreneurship. I mean, it could be for your academic pressures as well. Right? Most good institutions today actually have that. And you know, my daughter is in 12th grade and at least twice a year, you know, there's somebody. So, I mean, it's, I think the awareness is growing that the mental health is a, an extremely important aspect, whether it's academic, whether it's entrepreneur, or whether it's a high pressure corporate job. I mean, that's, that's here to stay. And uh, up until now, that was the elephant in the room. And slowly, I think we, we're starting to say, hey, wait a second, we can't ignore this thing. And we might as well go consciously do, uh, do it. And it, I think it has to be a collective journey, right? As you rightly pointed out, books can't tell you. Life will tell you that. And sure. I think we can engineer some of these things in a way to give them a sample. Uh, when life hits you, it's much harder. But at least knowing that, hey, it can be dealt with and I don't have to completely break up uh, is definitely knowledge. That knowledge can help. Maybe I'm going to step in with a technical question here. Aren't all of you saying the same thing? Because, I mean, Varun, no, you're no, Ganesh is saying that you can teach. You, I mean, you're teaching yourself on YouTube as well, right? I think you're just talking about the mode of being taught. Mm-hmm. And I think it comes down to a very personal question of you want to learn in a traditional setting, you want to learn through books, you want to learn through podcasts, you want to learn through YouTube. It is learning at the end of the day, right? The question is yeah. the time, right? Do I? It took me 20 years to figure out that failure is okay and that you'll survive and nothing bad's going to happen, right? Um, but why did I have to wait for 20 years? If I had gone through the kind of things that you're putting some of the kids through now uh, to say, you know, I, we got a really, really nice guy to come in and do a, a it's a storytelling form. Uh, they do a Romeo Juliet thing. Uh, we pair them up and, you know, they go through different emotions, you know, one of love, one of hatred, one of murder, right? Passion. Uh, and so... You know, we go through these exercises and it looks silly when you first do it. But having done this four times in the last two years, I mean, people actually say, you know what, this is the thing that I've never gone through in any of my courses. So, you know, it's nice, you know, in a two hour stretch to have gone through those emotions. And because entrepreneurship is that roller coaster, right? right? It, it, it's not this wonderful thing that we all read in, you know, the business thing of so many people raise so much money. But and you, you know, the the blood, sweat, and tears that go behind it. So we want people to say, hey, this is a very emotional journey. We, could, we talk about function process, but there's a hugely emotional part that, you know, at least if you expose them to the fact that there is this elephant and that needs to be looked at. Uh, so it's a question of time in my mind, but I think, yeah, we're, we're all kind of saying the same thing. On aspect, I think there's one part that I'd like to highlight. And if I kind of go back in my time, I think that's, that's the whole emotional balancing piece. And I don't know if I've cracked it completely, but I think you figure it out and you write it out and you kind of surround yourself with the right support system. But I think there's one more huge thing that a lot of us get very wrong is, um, you know, when you're trying to do something, there's always a lot of noise, right? There are There's a lot of noise from people who want to advise you because people love giving you advice, right? Then you go into... You hear positive and negative things constantly, right? I think it's the source that's giving you the information. Generally, there's affirmation that you want to hear. And sometimes you go down the wrong path, just listening to the wrong wrong people, both good and bad, right? And I think it, it's very quickly trying to realize what you want to absorb, right? I mean, if it's a lot of people saying, no, this is not going to work, it's your choice whether you want to listen or not. But I think there are a lot of paths where you're trying to validate your business idea, trying to validate what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And you're trying to collect feedback. And I think a lot of first-time entrepreneurs have selective hearing there. They start hearing what they want to hear and they kind of reject what they don't want to hear. And I think that's one of, it's a mistake a lot of us make and a lot of us make in different forms. And I think that can get really, really hard to kind of undo as you go forward. So I think apart from everything else, I think this is a big one, right? Who you listen to, what you listen to, and are you willing to hear things that you don't want to hear? And are you are you strong enough to listen to that and act on it? Great point. One aspect that we haven't touched on yet is entrepreneurship. So how has working in a large company either prepared you for um, being an entrepreneur or what's missing that you've had to uh, substitute? So Pavna, you've had both the corporate and the entrepreneur experience. Can you start us off with your perspective on this? My first ever and only corporate journey really was with Mahindra and Mahindra. Um, as a 20-year-old, I think it's very inherent to me that right? I went and found a project that would allow me to launch something. So I did kind of go into a setup that was already there and for me to learn from. But my first ever project within an entire large ecosystem was to kind of go launch Goa as a territory for Mahindra and Mahindra. Right. So I think it's also inherent to me that I find fun in everything I do. So 
you know, there was that piece, right? Um, take a project that looks impossible to you at that point and say, hey, I'm going to go figure it out. Um, so, yeah, I think it's that's how it works. You know, even if you're in a large, large corporate, kind of find what's what's exciting, what seems a little impossible, what seems difficult to kind of unravel. And if you can kind of do that, it's a little bit of that kind of builds the muscle for entrepreneurship in the long haul, right? Absolutely. And Sate, you've had a long career at uh, Intel. Can you share maybe how that experience has influenced the curriculum that you've built and also what similarities you see between entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, I'd say, disservice done to the entrepreneurship that can happen in a corporate environment, right? Some of, you know, we fantasize and we glorify uh, stuff that happens in a startup, oh, they're very agile, they're very nimble, they're very small, they can, you know, uh, change their directions, unlike, you know, a large corporate, which is like Titanic or like a big ship. So I think here are some of the positives, right? Having done a number of uh, really path-breaking things, um, uh, you know, the big company offers, first and foremost, uh, a fertile place where there's talent. I mean, you know, or, you know, look at any good company and there's a plenty of talent, a lot of excited folks, with some fantastic backgrounds and, you know, uh, backgrounds that they come in. Second, resources, unlimited, practically unlimited resources, whether it's in terms of, you know, infrastructures, um, labs, uh, money, capital and such. So talent and then resources. And lastly, I think one of the most important thing is a well-established pipeline uh, or a channel into a, you know, group of uh, customers or users. So that's completely all there for you from day one. Uh, so those are some of the things that I think the corporate uh, environment provides, which maybe, you know, if you're starting a startup, that may not be there. Some of the things that have influenced uh, the setting up of CIE, the Center for Innovation Entrepreneurship, is um, corporates have to, by definition, have to really solve uh, problems from the real world, right? I mean, it's not, uh, I don't have a whole lot of luxury in terms of just coming up with some, you know, blue sky and then saying, okay, what problem do I want to solve? And it has to be done in a short period of time. You have to mostly get it right. Um, so some of those learnings we've uh, taken that. And what we've said is that uh, rather than work on abstract ideas, we want to work on real problems. And the corporates have been very kind in that sense. And we found a way to take real problem, real world problems, strip it of the intellectual property, and then you know downsize it uh, because these are undergrads that we're talking about. So some of the problems statements have to be uh, trimmed, and that's given to us for about a semester. So it's a good six months that we can hack uh, on that. We get some great mentorship uh, and uh, from the corporates, and in return, what we've been able to uh, share with them uh, is you know joint publications. Uh, Excellent code checked into GitHub, which the corporates can show off and say, here are some sample things for our, some of our new frameworks in AIML. And lastly, I mean, you know, a fantastic talent pipeline, right, which is what all good companies look for. So I think it's been a very symbiotic relationship in terms of, um, you know, taking some of the good things that are there in the, in the corporate world and then uh, linking that to, you know, the academia and then trying to see if, you know, this could be a win-win for both. And, and Ganesh, I'm sure you have some thoughts on this as well. Care to chime in? I think uh, a couple of things that Satya said from a from a from an entrepreneurship perspective in large corporates is very critical. I think the market access is a huge uh, sort of uh, flip for an entrepreneur trying to figure it out on his own versus uh, an innovative idea coming out of a corporate. It may come with baggage depending on the culture of the uh, sort of the operating environment of the corporate, but market access is is by far uh, a big tipping point in in an early stage idea being proven, disproven, feedback out from prospects, customers, prototypes. I think that's an interesting one that uh, an early stage entrepreneur often struggles with. How through my network and how through my sweat and tears. Can I get to my first five customers? Can I even knock a door, get a meeting with a prospect who can even validate my proposition or just tell me this product is not working, you need to pivot. Right? That experience and that journey is a tough journey for an entrepreneur. In a large corporate, I think the opportunity we've always had is you've got market access. Can you make the rest of the ecosystem work so that you can capitalize on that market access? That's been a pivotal one. Thank you for sharing that perspective. Um, I do want to circle back to sort of um, the entrepreneurs on this panel. 
you know, I've heard, I haven't been an entrepreneur myself, but the journey is very lonely. And Varun, you talked about having a therapist and helping with that mental resilience. What other forms have you seen entrepreneurs take to uh, combat that loneliness? It, it's very subjective, actually, uh, how entrepreneurs deal with it. Uh, some get a therapist, some get a coach, some have friends. But the fact that it's a lonely journey is 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 definitive, right? Uh, you can't really talk to your family a lot about it because there are a lot of aspects that they don't understand. Sometimes they probably even get pissed with you because they're like, why are you working 14 hours a day and so on and so forth. And the windfall of entrepreneurship takes time, right? It takes about five to seven years to get an exit. Sometimes you don't get an exit. Sometimes all the work that you put in goes to waste because the startup fails. So that does not sit well with your family. If you're in a relationship or if you have a husband and wife, then that suffers a lot as well because you're always um, you're married to your work. You're obsessed about your work 24-7. Uh, so I don't know. It's like um, I think the problem with entrepreneurship is uh, the obsession is just too strong to let go. Right? It's just you're thinking about your startup 24-7. You just can't stop thinking about it. Because if you start stop thinking about it, your competitor is going to be beating you every single time. So it's almost like once you're in, you should be in uh, all in, right? And with, with all guns blazing and all of that. And you should be ready to handle the ups and downs, the lows, the uncertainties, the elements of failure and all of that, which I think can be uh, softened a bit uh, with a strong support system and a set of therapists or mental coach or what. But like I said, um, no matter what, it's still going to be that toxic relationship. I, I, can, I can guarantee you even the best entrepreneur in the world probably goes home and goes, goes home one day and be like, why am I doing this? Why can't I just uh, sell ice cream somewhere? Right? So uh, I don't think that can ever, ever stop. Um, so what I feel is that uh, the people who become entrepreneurs, right, are of a certain breed. Uh, they mostly either come from dysfunctional families or have, have a little bit of a dysfunctional Whoa. mindset. That's uh, a very interesting perspective. See, I'm, I'm not <laughs> able to go home today. I, I, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I think uh, you, need to, you need to have some chemical imbalance in your brain to actually go through this. And uh, yeah, so anybody sitting in the audience feels like... Uh, feels like they've come from a, a, a dysfunctional family or feels their mind is dysfunctional, trust me, entrepreneurship is the best thing for you. Uh, because if you love chaos, if you like love that. randomness, if you love uncertainty, if you don't know where your next meal or your next paycheck is going to come from, if you don't know how, what the next five years are going to be like, uh, if you don't know anything about anything in the future, um, then entrepreneurship is for you. But if you, want un if you want any level of certainty, do not venture into entrepreneurship. <laughs> And, you know, we've talked a lot about this, the low, you know, through this conversation. I'd like to um, have a different conversation now in your moments where you felt like, you know, why am I doing this? Uh, I want to break up with my startup. What sort of motivated you and actually lifted you up and back into it and energized you? So I'm going to take that. My husband jokes about it all the time, but I, I know he's serious. He thinks I have three modes, right? And it's, it's actually true. Three modes, which one is you're constantly multitasking. You're constantly trying to keep up and you're like, ah, I'm going to do everything under the sun. There's a second one, which you're, you're deeply optimistic, right? You feel like you're on top of the world and everything is rainbows and like sunshine. And the third one is the worst. Right? You're, you're down in the pits and then from there, it, it, it seems like nothing is ever going to get better, right? Um, three modes, nothing in between, nothing mild, right? It's all extreme. Right, and um, it's not gradual, it's high or low, and that's your mode. Uh, I think both require intervention, right? I think a lot of us think you only require intervention during the low, but you also need to be stopped when you're on the high, right? Uh, because you go to crazy things on the high, um, and you need like a reality check there, also saying don't go bite off more than you can handle because the low is coming, right? And um, I think a couple of things that I think people have to do, right? Um, a lot of ventures is a reason why nothing against solo founders, right? But I think having the right set of co-founders is deeply, deeply important, right? Um, it's important because there is nobody else in the world who will be going through what you're going through. And I don't think co-founders always are on the same page, right? Everybody brings something different. But when you're down in the pits or when you're going up, the reality check can only come from that circle. So I think co-founders is really important having the right board investors. Absolutely. 
you know, we talk about capital, but I think that ecosystem is changing a fair amount now where an investor has as much to lose, right? And I think the right investor becomes your sounding board. And I think they started playing a really important role, right? Because um, there is a business angle to which a lot of it does come from business, right? There's something breaking somewhere and you know that there's somebody to kind of go knock their door and say, hey, I want I want to kind of build this. So I think that's that's a really important relationship to stay in, right? Um, and it's only beneficial. A lot of people keep investors at a very far distance. Uh, but I think the minute that becomes transparent, it really starts, it all comes down to that support system, right? And uh, I think the cleanest thing about your law is uh, you have to find something to do when you're feeling like everything's broken. You have to kind of find a way to disconnect and you go distract yourself, whether you go cry it out if you have to, or you go uh, run, or you go box, or you do whatever, right? Or you just stop working because there's nothing productive that's going to come out of it. But I think everyone has to find that, you know, I'm going to sleep for the next 24 hours and I'm not going to work. But after 24 hours, if I feel the same way, then I got to do something about it. So I guess that system has to start getting built very, very early. I think just from what Ramna, you and Varun are saying, from our experience, one of the things we find a little undervalued is the value of a board and a value of an advisory. Uh, and and that's a, a board does not necessarily have to be an investor board. And we often confuse ourselves with that. Uh, and, and in through our incubation journey, we, we sort of started off by by the mentorship and the mentor panels that we introduced to the to the to the venture and the founding team. And we do hope at some point that sort of puts in a germ in the height in the minds of the founders that there is value in putting together a board and a panel of advisory because they are your sounding boards in in so many ways they are your fallback when when things go wrong people that you could talk to freely and frankly because your venture and you as a founder are going through that cathartic journey i think we undervalue the that the purpose that a good board and a good panel of advisors can help an early stage startup yeah. and the other that we try and this is when when a founding team is part of an incubator is the entire opportunity to buddy because you're part of an incubator's network and the alum and so on. You, there's, there's, just, there's just immeasurable value from the buddies and the friends that you find there. Uh, from past entrepreneurs, from current cohorts that you sort of bond with and you somehow have found a partner in crime. And, and that is a soft value that you, this is huge. Uh, Farina, I'd like to just give an example. I'd like to build on what Ganesh just said. I mean, the role of an advisor, right? I mean, uh, let's trip it all the financial and other things, but just what, what's an entrepreneur trying to do, right? Um, it doesn't matter what you're trying to do. You're, you, you are who you are. You, you're in a certain stage in your life and you're trying to embark on a completely new thing, right? Anything new brings along with its challenges, um, knowns, unknowns, and such, right? The role of an advisor, and when, you know, I came from a semiconductor industry and the startup was in the photovoltaic. It's an adjacent area, but, you know, there are a lot of similarities, but again, there are enough number of things that are completely different in terms of the business. The technology is the same, but the business dynamics are completely different. The first thing that, one of the first things I was advised, I didn't even know that, you know, you needed to have a really strong board, was an advisor who was thrust on me, right? Saying that, hey, while we picked you to be, you know, the head of this organization, please work this. And, and he had spent enough number of years and he coached me into building what was probably the best advisory board of the top 10 solar companies in India and build the advisory board. Every step of the way, when, you know, I was facing a wall, not knowing the answers, not knowing which questions to ask and to whom, yeah. you know, the board was the one that really, you know, covered my back, right? And got enough coaching and they were very kind with their time and their counsel. So the advisory board literally saved uh, not just me, but also the thing. The second thing that can really make a difference is, is timing, right? And I, want, and I want to combine timing with passion, right? So passion on its own, you know, is not going to carry far, right? I mean, that's everybody will say, oh, you got to have great passion. I think all of us do at the start of a journey when, you know, the stuff hits the fan, you know, passion alone is not enough, but you need that, right? And so let me give you an example of what I mean by passion and timing. So we stepped into this thing to create the first um, a business to business platform, B2B platform for photovoltaics in India in 2008. The timing was, you know, the country was rolling out the national solar mission. Uh, we needed to bring together all the different players, the government, the industry, uh, and the industry trade bodies, the regulators. So, uh, you know, when things were not going the way it 
it, it needed to there was an inspirational thing that said you know we as a country ought to be able to get this on, done right i mean there will be lots of push and pull so many things won't go in the way that you planned but hey we've got to take you know at least you know two steps forward even if you're taking one step back so the notion of yeah we had the passion to say hey we've got to have a policy we've got to you know create the industry body that goes and pulls the system the timing i think it also makes sense because you you are carried by the current right uh, a rising tide lifts all boats i mean that's something we've heard so i think you know having a great board picking the right idea at the right time and you know having that passion right because you know varun and babna are doing what they're doing because simply there's a you know that's something that comes from inside but you need something else outside to sustain it as well thank you for sharing that varun did you have anything else that you wanted to close off with no i think i think uh, uh, we were pretty, pretty much summed up everything i just probably want to add that anybody in the audience if you want to be uh, if I, i would say just start up once in your life it's one of the best <laughs> experiences you ever have whether you succeed or fail doesn't matter yeah. but just start up once no, because no, the no, learning no, that you're going to get is about it start up once in a high you can stop it yeah it, it it cannot it it cannot be replaced the learning that you get from from starting up it literally cannot be uh, replaced so yeah uh, probably replace that toxic relationship uh, with one stint at entrepreneurship and start up once because trust me it will be one of the most exciting and interesting journeys um, that you're going to have i and love that want- everything that you've said varun you end off with you have to do it I love yeah. that. I mean, you have to do, but you have to prepare to get damaged. <laughs> I mean, there are two ways to do it. You come and say, "I am going to get hurt. I'm ready for it. I weigh the pros and cons." And I'm also prepared that once I walk down this path, there's no going back because you're going to keep hurting yourself. Actually, you know, both Varun and Bhavna, right? Um, you know, I, I think sometimes you know, age and maturity actually also prepares you well. Uh, and there's a well-known study from MIT, right? The average age of successful uh, entrepreneurs is is not 26 not 33 it's somewhere in 44 to 45 i don't remember the exact number but it's mid 40s right um and my own experience of uh, being an entrepreneur much later than you know where you folks were um it clearly i think it helps right because by then you sort of know that life has its ups and downs not just on the entrepreneurial front on the family front life i mean you know you've been there you've kind of seen you know the highs and the lows i think uh, you know Uh, varun your advice is very sound everybody's got to try this at least once even if you're in 40s or 50s uh, but in order to do that the only thing i would say is you know have your family behind you right because this is a journey this is not an individual journey you and whether you like it or not whether you know it or not i mean you're pulling your family along this thing but if you prepare them well and if you prepare yourself uh, i remember from you know um for three years my wife and i sat and did a spreadsheet when my wife saw the spreadsheet i mean she just I think she just flipped and she said, are you nuts? Are you out of your mind? But over the three years, we actually built this thing to be, for her to be able to be comfortable enough. And then, you know, and then we cut the cord with, you know, the thing. And Bhavna, it's not a one-way street. Uh, I did, left Intel um, and started in 2008. And for whatever reason, right? I did this in 2011, came back to Intel and then we built a blockbuster product in 2015. So, you know, you can come and I think, times have changed so you can kind of go back and forth if you do want it but i won't recommend it to everybody i'm just kidding i mean of course you can go back uh, life is completely reversible uh, but yeah that's i guess just as you can say hey you know but you know a big pressure on you now we'll be we'll be tracking your entrepreneurship journey from now on <laughs> you heard it here outside. first i am going to become an entrepreneur in my lifetime at some point it's going to happen thank you for the motivation um um it's kind of getting to that time where we need to wrap up this panel so really quickly uh we're going to do a speed round i'm going to come to each one of you and if you could just leave us and the audience with a few inspiring words um ganesh over to you um i hope this is inspiring uh, but from from an from an academic business incubator perspective um th- there are many unknowns that an entrepreneur goes through and and through the journey uh, the entrepreneur also in my opinion develops as a person there's entrepreneur's abilities which mature and there's a venture and the venture's ability with, which matures and at some point of them that translates into the performance of the venture itself 
each of these three have dimensions of their own whether they are learned through intuition whether they are learned through experience or they are whether they learn through expertise there is value in each one of that learning and through the journey uh, i would never undervalue that learning that an entrepreneur and by extension therefore the venture goes through perfect thank you for that satya yeah um you know i think this the topic of this thing was you know how do you inspire entrepreneurship and for the inspired entrepreneurship to happen i think there must be something that you deeply care about and there's a very famous quote from gary hammer right that said create a cause um, not a business so you have to find out for yourself uh, what it is that you will really drive through the storm the rain uh, no matter what um, because that's something that deeply personal the second thing please don't get caught up in the hype uh, you can be an entrepreneur when you're 17 7 or 70 right take your own time prepare well for it prepare your family well for it and uh, you know you can taste that once in a lifetime thing that varun was talking about but don't hurry this don't fall for the hype uh, and definitely don't do it for the money because if you do it for the money you very quickly find out uh, this whole game just doesn't add up so find the right cause uh, prepare yourself for the journey and it is a once in a lifetime uh, thing and you really enjoy it and if you're in corporate guys just celebrate it uh, you've got a lot of things and ganesh also reaffirmed that the market access the network uh, coaching i mean a whole bunch of things and now is the best time for you to be at your true innovative self so very best wishes to all of you out there um, go be an entrepreneur whenever you choose to be <laughs> thank you wow very inspiring pavna your turn show sure, my mind is definitely for the women out there and it's um you know i would just say i'd keep it short and i'd say don't overthink it uh definitely hold yourself in much higher regard than you think you what you what you're capable of you know uh, i'm sure that's never a question right uh third surround yourself with people who will encourage you and be very clear that to tell them that it is going to get hard and when it gets hard what you expect from them is to tell to cheer you on and not ask you to stop right um and then i think the last one don't be too hard on yourself right i think uh, don't don't expect too much of yourself pick your battles face it well you don't have to do everything very well we're humans at the end of the day pick pick the couple of things that you want to focus on and then face yourself and that's that's the only way this can kind of make sense and um, yeah like varun said i mean i wouldn't be doing it three times if i didn't absolutely love it right it comes with a glow it comes with its lows but the highs are so high that you definitely want to experience Very well said. Thank you. Last Varun, over to you. Leave us with some inspiring thoughts. Well, I would just say uh, I mean, where was watching this? The only thing that I would say is become self-aware because once you become self-aware, you'll figure out what your true purpose in life is. And once you figure out what your true purpose in life is, then that's the path to happiness. Because from what I've discovered in the last 10 years, um a lot of other things that we think make us happy actually don't. but the sense of purpose is what really drives us every single day and to find the sense of purpose well you have to be more self aware and the only thing that should speed up your discovery of your uh, your 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 self awareness journey is to know the fact that well we just have 30 40 more years to live and every single human being you know right now will probably be dead in the next 99 years right <laughs> we're living with that just that one simple truth and i think that should speed up your self awareness journey and i would say if you want to travel go travel tomorrow If you want to tell that girl I I love you, you want to go. You should go to do that tomorrow. Whatever you want to do, just do it. Don't wait because you never know. You know where life could take you. So yeah, just just get on that self awareness journey and take life, uh, you know, to the next level. Thanks, Varun. We can always count on you for the unexpected yeah. comments. So thank you for that. And uh, with that, I'm just going to wrap up. It's been such a fascinating discussion we've had here today. Thank you for all the panelists for sharing their perspectives and uh having a healthy discussion. Uh, what I'll leave you with is uh some of my takeaways. The innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem is well and thriving in India and that's such an exciting uh time to be part of this journey. We're sort of at an inflection point and there's so much momentum that's been built. There are support systems in play and resources that you can access. to accelerate this journey and when we started this panel we started with a question can entrepreneurship be taught and um here's what we can agree on 
the technical and entrepreneurship skills can be taught, whether it's YouTube or traditional methods like classroom learning, but what cannot be taught but comes through life experiences, whether simulated or real, is the mindset and mental resilience. So thank you all for joining us today. There's more to discover at Converge. You don't want to miss it. We'll see you at the next session. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you very much.